And so I learned from experience that being afraid of something doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't pursue it. It's such a human thing to like tell stories. I I've always had like a big imagination. When I was a kid, I had like Legos and, and Playmobil and action figures and all these different little dolls that you can tell stories with. And I was always, I was always doing it. But it took me a while to realize that was like a thing I wanted to do with my life. Find the seed of whatever is true to you and nourish that seed and, and flesh it out. But also don't be afraid to like let some stuff not be said. The audience or the, the reader will fill in some of that gaps themselves. Jesse Robkin, a.k.a. Titty Pills, is a writer, filmmaker, and magic player. Jesse is known for her work with the Modern Underworld Breach deck and has been absolutely crushing the Nerd Rage Gaming Tournament series. She has even started her own Patreon for in-depth magic strategy content. Jessie, however, is so much more than your average everyday tournament grinder. She's currently fundraising for her short film, Stress Fracture. Jessie is writing and producing the film and needs community support to greenlight the project. Check it out in the link down below. In true Humans and Magic fashion, we explore the intersectionality of Jessie's identity, creative process, and magic love -wops. This is Jesse Robkin. All right, Jesse, how are you doing today? <sighs> I am in this moment right now. I'm doing great. I, you know, life is busy. Um, there's definitely some stress, but it's it's stress because I care about the things I'm doing, not stress because anyone else is putting it on me. So, um, I feel I feel like both good with where I am right now and good with like the direction I'm headed. Um, and I think there's something, I think there's something valuable in being in a position where the things you do matter and it could go wrong, you know? Um, so yeah, I would say I'm, I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I am excited to talk to you. And I just want to say also in res with, res with respect to what you just said, there is something exciting about the unknown, right? There is something yeah. exciting about not knowing the outcome and trying to do what we can to try to get the best possible outcome, even though at the end of the day, we know it's not entirely within our control, right? Yeah. Well, and part of why I like sort of maneuvered myself into the position I'm in right now is because for several years, I felt like there was no, like, there's no way anything I was doing could go wrong really, but also it couldn't go particularly well. I was just sort of coasting. And, um, I feel like the risk of failure was something I, I was really missing. And I finally feel like I'm in a position now where like I'm taking risks in a way that's exciting and, um, also like high risk, high reward type situation, or I guess medium risk, high reward, high reward. <laughs> Do you consider yourself a thrill seeker generally, or is it more of a calculated risk? That's a great question. I, I honestly, my inclination is to avoid risk. I'm very, I'm terrified of risk, but I have learned in my adult life, especially that every time I've followed, like every time I felt afraid about something, about doing something for the most part, it's because I've really wanted it. And the fear comes from, I'm afraid of trying to get it and failing. Um, and every time I followed that fear, good things have happened. Um, and happiness has followed. So in that sense, um, I have become a more of a, a thrill seeker, but not like a, not, I'm not like paragliding or, or cliff jumping or anything like that. I am like, you know, I'm seeking the thrills that tell me that I'm in the right, I'm headed in the right direction. Were there certain wake up moments or things that happened in the past that made you go in this direction? Partly it's my transition. I would say, um, I would like, I, every step along the route towards transitioning is a risk. Um, because you, the most things in transition are permanent. You can't go back, you know, especially some of the bigger ones like, uh, surgery. Um, and, and so I 
learn from experience that being afraid of something doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't pursue it. Um, surgery being like the like peak example, um, which I, I, it, it was a very interesting process. Um, uh, and beforehand I was very, I was very like afraid of, of, you know, undergoing, we're really jumping deep, right, <laughs> right, right off the bat. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was really afraid of, um, undergoing surgery. Um, and my therapist told me like she, she used to uh, be, uh, a therapist, uh, for like intensive care wards where, um, people were undergoing like life-saving, like, like undeniably life-saving surgeries, like, uh, you know, organ transplants and things like that. And, um, there was this phenomenon that would happen that like the, the higher up people got on the list, the more likely they were to be like, ah, do I really need a liver or whatever? Mm. You know, <laughs> like, really need a liver? <laughs> and it's like, yeah, obviously like, you know, like the, these, like it's, it's laughable how, how clearly life-saving these like treatments were and they still were trying to like talk themselves out of it. And that made me feel a little bit better about the fact that it's like, you know, I, like for, in my case, it was like, gender confirmation surgery, um, I, I wanted a vagina, but I didn't want surgery and I was deathly afraid of it. Um, but I realized that it, that didn't mean I was doubting my own, what I needed. It just meant the process was scary. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't really remember what the beginning of the question was, but <laughs> no, that's, that's fine. But how do you, how do you convince yourself of such a major decision? Like, did you have to, because at the end of the day, I feel like that is something that you can't really just get the answer from anyone but yourself, right? Yeah. It was tough. I tried three times to, to go through with it um, and got cold feet twice. Um, I remember describing it to a friend of mine. Uh, when, my senior year of college, I was like on my way to a party after having pre-gamed with a friend of mine who was also trans and I was talking about, um, surgery and how I was afraid of it and, and how I had, I had tried to go through with it the previous year and, and then got back down. Um, and, uh, I was like describing it as like being at the edge of this cliff and knowing I had to get to the other side of the cliff. And the only way to do it was by jumping and, I was so afraid to do that because if I fell, it would be, you know, devastating. Um, and so I was just like pacing back and forth, but, but like, I was just constantly pacing. It, it was never like I was ever going to get to the other side without jumping. Um, and then the other thing that I realized was, um, I would rather try and fail I was so miserable with, with like my anatomy as it existed, you know, beforehand, um, that I was going, I would prefer to be like, to live with like a botched surgery than to live with what I had instead. And so that was the other thing I told myself was like, this might go badly. It probably won't. Like I'm going to a good surgeon, but like, I... If it does, that's still preferable to the situation I was already in, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So to use the cliff analogy, um, it's, I don't, I don't like, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it's like, you, you, you know, you need to jump and you also have this sort of hope or faith that you're going to like fly across the other side of the cliff. Like yeah. it's that you're not going to just plummet. Like that is really, cause, cause what you're saying is that there's always a risk, right? So there's yeah. always, um, that fear. Yes. Yeah. And, and the result is also that it's not as far, it's not as wide of a gulf as, as you thought. Um, right. Right. So yeah. it is, it is jumpable, which I mean, in hindsight, it, it, it is jumpable, but it doesn't make the thing, um, any less scary or anxious or in the, in the moment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that I was told was, um, <laughs> uh, I, I was like, I realized I think someone, it was my surgeon said to me, she was like, well, I get that you're nervous, but you don't have to be nervous because you don't have to do anything. You just have to show up and then I'm the one doing it. I should be yeah, nervous. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Like I, yeah. you know, I get to be passive through it. 
you're you're unconscious, not conscious. So hopefully yeah. you just wake up and things will be will be okay. Yeah. yeah. Turns out I woke up and there was a global pandemic happening, but uh, I I got surgery on March 10th, 2020. So the day after oh, my what surgery, timing. yeah, yeah the, the day after my surgery, I was in the hospital bed with my pelvis uh, torn open and uh, learning about the, you know, it was like Tom Hanks had the virus, the NBA was canceled and everyone had to stay home. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I know, I know you're into movies. Like you must have watched 28 Days Later, right? <laughs> I haven't seen it. No. Uh, okay. But yeah, similar vibe, I think. <laughs> it's just the premise of waking up in this sort of apocalypse where it's like, what the heck happened to everybody? And yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm sure there's a million other movies like that too. So. Well, I want to write a, a. At some point in my life, I'm going to write a story, and I don't know what the medium will be yet, whether it's a novel or a movie or a play or something. But I'm going to write a story about a like trans girl who. Uh, goes in for surgery and then wakes up to the zombie apocalypse and then has to do like all of the, um, like, uh, post-op recovery stuff that you have to do while also surviving this apocalypse, which, and like the, the like impetus, like obviously the, the, like the, the parallels are, are very clear, but I'm also very interested because I feel like apocalyptic stories never take into account like the other things people need to do to survive sometimes. Like, yeah. Like if I was in the apocalypse, I would have to figure out how to find hormones because like, uh, the factories or whatever that like pro yeah. the labs that produce estrogen yeah. would no longer, um, exist. Um, and if I don't have access to estrogen, I would get osteoporosis and die. Like my body no longer produces testosterone. Um, so I would have to find the titty pill lab, uh, you know, and break <laughs> in and like get a supply. Yeah. And I would have to like ration those th the same way people ration mm -hmm. food. And so I think that that would lead to like a really interesting sort of twist on, cause we've seen infinite zombie apocalypse movies at this point. Uh, but it'd be an interesting twist on the story of like, you know, like, like trying to dilate with like zombies kicking down the door or whatever. And like, mm -hmm. it's like, I just need, you know, I need to do this so I can heal <laughs> and stuff like that. That is a really interesting premise. I don't think anyone's ever, as far as I know, really tackle that right yeah i'm not sure i have not heard i mean maybe someone has but i i have not heard of any like post uh post or maybe it's like a, a small detail for one of the characters in like in the context of a larger story right but you wanted yeah. to kind of make that your protagonist and what they're exactly going through, right? and yeah my working title is post apocalypse <laughs> <laughs> that's a hollywood blockbuster right there exactly so do, do you are you able to would you be able, in this theoretical apocalypse right would you be able to raid the pharmacy for for that's traces the, of that's this, the idea yeah okay. so it'd be like you know similar to like I, I feel like there are zombie movies where like they have to like get the cure or whatever and they like break into the the hospital and like get the cure but in our case we would be like breaking in and like getting you know vials of estrogen or like you know bottles of pills and stuff um and uh yeah and like you know to add conflict maybe like it's been a couple of days since we ran out or something right. um, or we like get to a, a lab and there isn't and they've already been you know ransacked or whatever yeah. so Maybe there's yeah. another trans character that's oh, like yeah, the you villain. To fight. <laughs> you gotta like figure out if you have to fight or share and oh, I love that. intrigue about that. Like Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's such a good idea. Maybe there's yeah. like someone in the, in this remote hill, like who's created a hormone factory because they're trans and you have to figure out like, do I try to like take it over or do I try to try to Befriend come them. harmoniously? Yeah. 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 See, there's so much, there, there's like such ripe, uh, like such fertile ground there that just doesn't get tapped into because every protagonist of like horror things are like cis able-bodied nothing wrong with them in the in the slightest you know <laughs> right so yeah and what if like the trans characters have like some sort of special immunity to the zombies I don't oh know, yeah like, yeah that could be interesting too. well that would make even more like yeah like <laughs> even more demand for like the hormones or something if like there was something about like the estradiol that like <laughs> <laughs> what like caused immunity or something yeah yeah but on a on a on a much uh, simple note, I've thought about what would happen if I were in this sort of apocalypse, and I think I'd just be fucked because like I'm yeah. wearing glasses, prescription <laughs> oh, glasses. Yeah. Literally, like I was thinking, like to beat somebody in the apocalypse, all you would have to do is take their glasses and crush them. Like yeah. they would not be able to see, fight, oh, chase my you. And this is actually the reason I heard why like 
uh, people who are like more affluent, like besides getting private islands, they've all gotten LASIK surgery because like oh, you can't wow. let this be a weakness when like, in addition to not having your stash or a helicopter or your own island, like yeah. if you need what I need, you're just fucked, right? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's such a good point. I mean, maybe you could like get like, like try to like find more durable, like goggles or something that like do a similar thing. But yeah, the whole idea of like, I read an article a few years ago about like, uh, there was like a climate scientist, I think, or some sort of like sociologist of some kind. Anyway, there was like a guy who was an expert in his field who was like hired by these, um, rich people, um, to talk quote climate solutions. But when he showed up, he had this whole presentation planned and instead of ha giving the presentation, the like people, the rich people were like asking him all these questions about like, okay, well, if I hire like bodyguards, how do I prevent them from turning on me? How do I like, you know, like, and all the, all these questions about like making it very clear that they were not interested in preventing climate change. They were interested in protecting themselves and hoarding resources during climate change. And that mm -hmm. was one of the most dystopian and like horrifying of all this like doomeristic like climate change things that have been out there. And obviously there's been a lot and they've mm -hmm. all been scary, but like that, that one might be the most scary in some ways. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. And very real. Right. Because I, I feel like climate change is real. And, you know, I've read a lot over the past year about, you know, EA effective altruism and like trying to save future generations. And I'm sorry if I'm going into stuff that you have no interest in or have never heard I, about, I, I'm but certainly am interested. Okay. There but, was a time um, when I was, it was yeah. debilitating how, how scary it was for me. Like, oh, I, really? I, okay. Yeah. So you, it was like very much occupying, uh, your mental space in a way. Yeah. I could, couldn't get out of bed. Um, oh, wow. Okay. I was so afraid. I was so scared, like depressed about it all. I had a, I don't know if I would call it depression, but I had a, a period of time where I was really thinking about all this stuff. And, um, I had read some books about, you know, the, the history of human civilization and just thinking how, think about how small I am in the scheme of things, but also how like powerless we all are in terms of, um, the future and also the present. And it's just the way I got out of it was basically to stop thinking about it. Cause I really couldn't figure out a way other than just ignorance is bliss. Yeah. Um, I did talk to my therapist a little bit about that, but I had a, some other stuff going on as well too. So it was like, I don't know. It's, it's just really hard. Like I have this, I have this tendency to like, just overthink a lot of things. I don't know if you're that way as well, oh, but yeah. it's like when you go down that rat hole, it, it just never, it just never ends. And then people always say like, James, why are you, why do you think about all that stuff? And it's just like, and I'm just like, why not? Right. So. Yeah. Well, for me, I, it hit, it's like not peak, I guess, but Valley, uh, at, it was like the, the fall after I had graduated from college. Um, and there were a bunch of articles coming out about being like, you know, we have like two or three years or whatever to combat climate change before it's too late. And, um, and I, it was so, it was like this idea that like I could be entering the world right when it's ending and like i wasn't gonna get to like have all these things that like i grew up just assuming i would have like you know a full life and you know all these milestones and stuff it made me wonder like what the point was of anything like how do you convince yourself to get out of bed at all or, or live your life at all um and my sort of solution solution is not really the right word for it but my like coping mechanism wound up being, uh, I, well, it was a couple of things, but the primary one was realizing that if I'd stopped living now or then, uh, it was like the world had ended, you know, X number of years early. Um, and I would much rather just make the most of whatever, it, like, yes, it's unfair. Yes. It, yes. It shouldn't have be this way yes, by all rights, people of my generation should get to live to be to like their natural conclusion of their life. And maybe that won't happen. Seems increasingly likely maybe that, that the world will drastically shift in this, in the somewhat near future. But like, I can't control that, so to speak. Like I, there are little things I can do, but individuals really have very little agency with regard to that. Um, and all I can do is like, 
Like say, say I die at 40 in like a climate apocalypse. Like, is that unfair? Yes. But like, would I rather have, I mean, at the time I was 22. So would I rather have like 18 years of like living the best life I could before that? Or would I rather have 18 fewer years of that? Um, mm. And uh, it was, it, it sort of lined up with coming across a, a poem that really affected me uh, by Gwendolyn Brooks called uh, To the Young That Want to Die. Have you heard of it? I have not, but I definitely will Google this after and try to read it. Yeah, it's like, basically the premise is like, you don't like death will wait. Death is the most patient, you know, uh, you don't have to die today. Just see what, just wait till tomorrow, wait till tomorrow, wait till tomorrow, keep pushing it because, um, once you're dead, that's it, you know, you're dead forever. Um, and you know, a millennia from now you, your dead soul won't care whether or not it was, it ha you know, like it, it, the dead version of you will not have been like, Oh, thank God. I like got there 18 years or sooner or like, you know, <laughs> 50 years sooner. Yeah. Like at the end of the day, the only thing that we have, there's no dead version of you consciousness, right? Yeah, exactly. So you might as well just live, even if it's not yeah. always easy or fun or, you know, yeah. and I really took that to heart basically. Mm -hmm. That's what I kind of realize as I get older is that like, there's a, so many like TLDR solutions or, um, coping mechanisms that I could have just avoided this whole mess if I just like did what 80% of other people were doing already. But instead I had to like explore and I had to like mess myself up and had to like really doubt myself to get there. But I guess that's part of the, the journey. So the cliche goes, right? So. Yeah. And yeah. And I, I definitely think that like we sort of discover things or realize things or learn things, uh, at the earliest we can, like, it's unlikely that it's the first time we've ever actually encountered a lot of the ideas, but it's the first time that they sink in or whatever. So I do in general, try not to spend too much time bogged down on like, well, I could have, if I had just done this earlier, this would have been possible or something. Although obviously it's, it's hard not to ever think that way, but I, I try not to feed those thoughts as much as I can. Yeah. Yeah. So having, putting all of that, what we just said in context, I, I'm going to assume that you're, you're having a, a stressful, busy time, but it's all good, right? Because you are, you are kind of advancing your goals while we're here on this like short brief while on earth. And, uh, like you're doing projects that, uh, you're passionate about, right? So things overall, I assume are on the up and up. Yeah. So it's really, yeah, I, <laughs> it's another thing of like, what, like, you know, when I die, will I also be like, oh, thank God I like made a, a movie or whatever. But like, it's not really about that, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah, I would say like a lot of positive things are lining up in my life right now. Um, you know, I quit my day job, uh, my last day at, I used to work as like an administrative assistant for the graduate chemistry department at Northwestern University in, uh, in Evanston, Illinois. And uh, I quit my day job on like April 1st of last year. Um, and really quickly, like stuff just was happening. Like I started writing, well, I like put in my, my, uh, notice and like in early March and then a few hours later got offered a, um, a commission to write a short play for a theater here in Chicago, um, based on like a real world event, uh, for their, like, it's called their living newspaper festival. Um, so like that happened and it felt like, you know, the universe sort of validating my choice to quit. And then like a couple weeks later, I top eight the, uh, um, uh, 5k modern 5k in, at SCG Indie with, uh, the, is it underworld breach deck? Um, and the art, my article about that, like, you know, kind of explodes a little bit. Um, and then from there, like on my, like the day after my last day of work, I got a message um, from uh, the professor, uh, the Tulare Community College professor, basically being like, you uh, letting me know he was like interested in um, hiring a new script writer. And I was like, oh, like, you know, here I am having quit my job. Like, I know a lot about magic. I'm like a good writer. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just wild how many of like things sort of in the last year. And then I had like the summer of some competitive success on the NRG circuit. 
in, in so many ways, things were like lining up for me uh, in the last year, partly because I sort of bet on myself and took that risk by quitting my job and partly because of luck. Um, and um, I would say to some extent, because I like had prepared for it um, in some ways. Uh, and yeah, like around, you know, a year ago, I realized that like, so something that I've wanted to do in my life is like be, I want to tell stories for a living. I want to write for a living. Um, I would love to make films and write plays. Um, and those are like my, the things I'm most passionate about. Um, and I've wanted that for a while, but for a long time, I wasn't really like pushing myself forward in, in those sort of fields. Um, for a number of reasons, partly was like depression re relating to, you know, the state of the world and my own brain. Um, part of it was, uh, being so focused on transitioning and like getting my body to be how I want it to look. And part of it was fear of trying and failing. Um, but a year ago I was like, I guess like I, I theoretically, I know a lot of people, I think it's theoretically possible. I could raise enough funds to film a movie. I'm capable of writing, you know, a story that's long enough. Um, and really the only thing standing in the way of me making a short film is me deciding I'm going to make a short film. Uh, and so I was like, well, what am I doing? I should just, I should just try and see what happens. Um, and there were some false starts and setbacks along the way. Um, but then as of January of this year, I basically like sat up, I was like, struggling to fall asleep one night. Uh, I, I had this like script that I had written and like wanted to make into a movie, but I was like waffling and like sort of, you know, pacing back and forth at the edge of that cliff on it. Um, and then one night I just had this like line of dialogue in my head over and over and over again, could not shake it. Uh, and, uh, finally was like, all right, I clearly, I have to write, I'm gonna have to rewrite this entire film right now at 2am. So I like sat up and like rewrote the whole thing. Um, and stayed up super late doing that and felt so energized when I had finished. I like suddenly got the ball rolling, like hiring people, like other, other filmmakers for the various roles. And, um, basically ever since then I have been moving forward on that track. And for the first time in my life, I feel like I am moving forward on almost every aspect of my life that, that makes me feel alive and, and feel joyful. Um, and that's, it's, it's a really exciting time as busy as it is. And as like, you know, as hectic as it has been and as scary in a lot of ways as it has been. Yeah. I'm so happy for you. Thank and you. And it's interesting to see that shadow fall over you as you're talking. And I realize it's the cat. Yes. Um, uh, this is Mia for the video watchers at home. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my roommate's cat has decided that my lap is the spot for right now. What was the line of dialogue that was running in your head that made it, you rewrite the whole thing? It was do you ever get deja vu? Um, and, uh, it made me, it, I real, so basically, so the premise of my short film, uh, for those of you that, you know, haven't seen it on Twitter, my short film is called stress fracture. And it's about a like trans girl who has always had like some sort of ripples of, uh, derealization happening in her head, um, throughout her life. But when she started transitioning, it became much worse because, um, the like sensation of being, of being like, I know I'm a woman, but everyone sees me as a man. Make, it's like, it's a really disorienting experience. And, um, so this story is about like a, a trans woman who that experience made her sort of worsened ripples of psychosis inside of her. And she's struggling to deal with that. And she's afraid to admit it, uh, to her partner, who's also trans because she's afraid he will leave her because of it, um, or see her differently. And, um, so basically I realized, like, I had this like line of dialogue in my head over and over again, and, and I started using, and that was ended up becoming this sort of like thread that I weaved through the story that gave the story some velocity because, um, in the film, we keep getting dragged back to like similar moments that like, are like deja vu esque, you know? Um, and, or maybe just the same moment. Uh, and she asks her partner that line at one point. And like, so that, that like sensation of deja vu, like keeps, it keeps dragging her back almost like tied, like, like waves, you know? Um, 
And so, yeah, that's the uh, sort of the gist of it. Basically, I'm very interested in the concept of memory and like how every time you recall a moment from your past, you change that moment in your head slightly and enough re recollection of the same moment. And all of a sudden, the thing you're remembering might not have actually happened that way at all. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. What was it that made you decide to make it into a film or choose film as a medium, as opposed to a play, which you've done in the past, or as opposed to writing? Like, was there something specifically about a visual medium that you wanted to tell the story in? Yeah, I, there's, so part of it was I wanted to write a film because um, I've been really interested in that art form and I have not really delved deeply into it. Um, so I was sort of approaching it like, I want to write a film, how do I do that? There's something else about, uh, film, unlike with, uh, like theater, for instance, you have a lot more control over, uh, the action that's taking place. Number one, the, uh, where the eye of the audience is going number two. So it's like, uh, you, you can be like, this is the thing that the audience will notice. Whereas on stage, you put a bunch of stuff on stage, but you but they could look wherever they want at any given right. moment. And it's different from night to night. Whereas in film, you you film it, you record it, you splice it all together, and then it's one objective, solid thing forever. Um, and so I wanted to take this sort of uh, uh, like ethereal experience and make it objective and see if I can like create like a, a sort of subjective experience out of this very objective medium. Uh, and so that's sort of the reason I don't think this story would work remotely at all on stage because mm -hmm. it would be too hard to make the audience see or feel the things you want them to see and feel. Mm -hmm. Maybe harder on stage, but how would you compare that to perhaps uh, a piece of writing or mm. a novel? It could, I think this, this could be a novel. Um, some of it is like, it's a, it's a very visual film in a lot of ways, I think. Um, and the other thing is I have, I don't really write, uh, I have not written a novel. I've written like a couple of short stories in my life. Um, but I'm not, that's not like my sort of go-to medium. I do, I would like to, at some point in my life, write a novel, but, um, as of right now, at least, uh, I'm, I'm much more, I prefer just, I, I like dialogue and I don't care that much about the other stuff, <laughs> you know, got it, got it. Dialogue driven. So would you say it's the theme that you're going for in this film? Like, is it, is there, is there like a common thread that runs through all of your creative work? Cause I, mm -hmm. I have to admit, I've not seen your, your plays or past work, but I'm curious of like, if there's a. There's, there's a trend. I suspect there may be based on the description you have on your website, but, um, <laughs> yeah. maybe talk yeah. about that a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, my website sort of goes the, the like description on my website is definitely more, uh, sort of full frontal. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> I sort of the, the way I would describe it is like, I'm very interested in the, like, raw unfiltered perspectives of like a trans person who has been through a lot of shit basically um so like uh for example like okay so there is a uh this is obviously not an easy thing to go through transitioning in this world that like is pretty hostile to trans people um and it leaves you with like a lot of like scars and, and wounds. Um, and there have been times in my life more so than now where I've been very angry about the way that like, about like the way that my existence has turned out in a lot of ways. And so, uh, a lot of my work, uh, I describe it as like sort of a mundane brutality, like, a. um, there's something about just like just this casual cruelty to borrow a Taylor Swift lyric uh, <laughs> um, that like this sort of cis society have like sort of like just so just some of the, the worst things that a person could do and they do it and so sort of like 
thoughtlessly. Um, and then they ignore it, you know, um, I, I had like, I described it in a, um, uh, like application that I sent in a, a play, um, I sent in for like this, like play submission opportunity. Um, and, uh, I, I described it as like, my transition is like crawling across broken glass, like dragging my body across broken glass in the busiest street in town. And the passersby are all Don't like do anything. gawking like at whatever. me, but not, oh, okay. not helping. Or some of them are pointedly trying to ignore me. And, and then they forget about me the moment they're gone, you know? And like, meanwhile, I'm like tearing myself apart somewhat literally. Mm. Um, and then you get to the other side and they're ridiculing you for it, you know? And, um, yeah, it's not, there's a lot of things about it that aren't pleasant. Um, and I want to be very clear because obviously this is like, you know, a like public discussion, right? Mm. This is in no way the fault of transness or trans people. This is like 100% like things that like cis people have like structured society to do and, and to act like, you know, like, like we, cultivated societal norms. You know, yes. Like. like there is nothing about transness inherently that needs to be this cruel. And yet in this world that we live in, it is. Um, and I have been transitioning. I, I first realized I was trans in 2015. Um, I have been on hormones since uh, mid 2016. So I'm, I'm approaching what, like seven, eight years at this point on hormones. Um, I was there, you know, when the Caitlyn Jenner stuff brought this to the forefront of the public conversation, I was there in the immediate wave of support that followed that. And then the really, really violent backlash that came after that. Um, for every year that I have been transitioning, uh, there have been that the number of like trans people and especially trans women of color who have been murdered, uh, has like gone up, mm -hmm. uh, by far the like most persecuted demographic in terms of like, you know, violent persecution per capita. Um, and, uh, it, I, I have become somewhat numb to in the face of it, which is not a good thing. Um, and so my work largely is an attempt at feeling again mm. and also an attempt at like honestly depicting what this has been like, you know, mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. what everyday life is like. It's so the like cruelty that I suffer is so boring, you know, <laughs> and the mundane so cruelty, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I don't, and I want, and I also want to be clear that I don't, I'm not interested in trauma porn, like, you know, depicting trans trauma for, you know, to like, to gawk at or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of interested. To titillate, right? Or yeah. Like or that. anything like that. Yeah. I'm interested in depicting trans trauma and like grabbing cis people the ba by the back of the head and shoving their face in it and twisting their face in it. So they can't ignore it anymore and they have to physically feel it. That's what I want out of my art. Um, now, you know, the way that I do that is varies. I have one play that's like extremely brutal. And then I have other plays that are much more subtle, but all of them are very, in my opinion, very honest about what it's like to go through this. Yeah. Are you wanting the audience to develop, especially perhaps the cis audience to develop a kind of empathy? or understanding or awareness or all of the above or something else. I mean, that would be nice. I, I, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily think that's like, I don't know. I go back and forth a little bit on that because, um, there was definitely a time in my like creative journey where I thought, I want to create something. I want to tell a story that, and the audience leaves the space changed and more empathetic towards trans people. And I think that's a somewhat naive way to look at 
human beings because part of the issue is the people seeing when I, if i were to have a, a play on stage most of the people seeing it are already largely on my side or are not the problem you know mm -hmm. and the people that aren't on my side and seeing it it's pretty tricky to like show them the truth without them like getting up and leaving or whatever <laughs> and there's something somewhat masturbatory about the medium of theater and part of why i've been interested in getting more into film uh there's this belief i think in a lot of theater spaces that like we're doing the great work and we're the ones that are like you know driving the conversation of society forward but we're preaching to the choir. We're, 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 it's all the same people that have, have, you know, already are listening or whatever. And so, um, so while it would be nice if people had more empathy after seeing something that I've written on stage, um, and I think it's definitely possible for that to be true. Um, I think what I actually want them to feel is not empathetic, but complicit. Um, I want them to feel like this is happening out there and I personally am not doing enough to prevent it. You know, <laughs> I'm mm. not trying to appeal to their humanity. I'm trying to appeal to their guilt um, mm. or, or if it maybe appeals the wrong word, but make that like sort of flare up in a lot of ways. No, um, I think appeals the right word. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, <laughs> it's, oh, I mean, you can sugarcoat it or one could sugarcoat it, but I think that's what it's about, right? And I think, I think there's something very practical in that. And I don't think you should shy away from describing it that way. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I yeah. appreciate that. Thank you. But yeah, it's interesting. And I, and, and, um, I think there's, you know, a lot of ways to do the things that, um, the other thing that I'm trying to sort of imbue the audience in with at least, with at least one of my plays and maybe a few of them actually, uh, is have them leave the space with a sense of agency with a, with a sense that they personally can actually have yeah, an impact the on the it. life of their tra of the mm -hmm. trans people in their life, that they don't have yeah. to be passive. Um, I want so I have a, a play called the chain. Um, and it's about like, a, it's like an absurd living room drama. And it's about this like trans girl who, um, is, uh, naked and chained to the wall by her pelvis in front of like her whole family. And, uh, they sort of ignore her and like go about their day. And like, sometimes they interact with her. Sometimes they ridicule her. Sometimes it gets pretty bad. Um, but largely she's just a, a fixture in their life that they don't really address that much. Um, and it, she is trying to get this key to unlock herself. And eventually a key shows up on stage. Uh, one of the characters brings it on, uh, and, but she can't reach it and they're not willing to give it to her. She eventually realizes she can't rely on them and she turns to the audience and she starts calling out specific audience members like you in the gray sweater like i see you there um uh, you've been watching this whole time you know come on stage give me the key um and if any audience addressing member... that complicity right exactly yes. and and trying to give a sense of agency right and mm -hmm. uh, if any audience member does stand up uh the rest of the cast is like written into the script that they're supposed to like turn to them and be like what are you doing you're in a play sit down you're ruining it for everybody <laughs> uh and so there's but meanwhile like the the trans girl is like still begging like uh, no they can't right. stop you they can't prevent you from coming on stage and then there's two different endings depending on whether or not the audience member goes through with it there's an ending where she gets to escape and there's an ending where, where yeah. you know and anyway so um that is that's so the type cool, of thing yeah that's that the type is, of that thing that so i'm really cool. excited about <laughs> yeah 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 that that's like um I mean, it's obviously breaking the fourth wall, but it's also this sort of, um, yeah, I just feel like that's really cool. Like if I was in the audience, I would be, that would make me think. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'm also at the age now where it's like, I, I'm 40. So I'm, I'm just like, I was very much like thinking before that, you know, film and music and things could change the world. But now it's just like, if I can just pay attention throughout the thing and remember like 5% of it, like the week after, that's a win, right? So yeah. if I'm creating something, like even if someone hears this interview and they might, they're not gonna remember everything cause it's, it's an hour or whatever. Yeah. Um, but you know, if they get a good vibe about Jesse or this conversation, that's all I want. Like yeah. I just want like a, a sliver or a fragment of, uh, something that goes into their consciousness. I'm not aiming for like, I mean, obviously I'm not making a film, but I'm just saying, even if I were making a film, even if I were Spielberg, yeah. I don't think the world is a world today where like if ET came out tomorrow, I don't think people will remember ET like the way yeah. they did in the, in the eighties or nineties. It's just like, we're just not 
wired that way anymore. And it's just like, as a creative, you just kind of have to adapt. Right. So yeah. I, I, I was also thinking in the back of my mind, asking you the questions. It's like, I think film is just a much more effective medium than, um, having a novel or having text because who reads these days, honestly, besides exactly. you and I, there's not a lot of people. So it's like, if you want to get it out there, you got to figure out the best, the best medium, right? So. Yeah. Well, one of my biggest artistic inspirations is, um, a, uh, theater group, uh, in Kerala, India in the, uh, that started around the 1950s post colonial India. Um, and, uh, they were called the Kerala people's arts club. And they put on over the course of the last 50 years of the 20th century, like thousands of productions of this play called you made me a communist. Um, and the pl the premise was very simple. It was like a farmer who like lost his land or something. I don't, I don't really know exactly what the story was, but it, more important than the story was how they did it. They took a like very like, com like total understanding of what, um, drove sort of the, the like, uh, storytelling in India and like uh, traditional storytelling in India. There's a lot of music. There's a lot of like audience involvement, like dancing, things like that. Um, and also just like a really strong understanding of like the caste system in post, uh, uh, colonial India. And like they performed the play, like on like marketplace in marketplaces on street corners, like out in the public places where the cast would mix. Um, and they would, uh, change the, uh, performance from night to night every single show was slightly different uh there would be songs and you know sometimes the songs would change and the audience was being encouraged to sing along and at the end of the play uh audience members would come on stage and like lift up this like uh communist flag with the uh with the farmer and uh and historians um point to uh the care like this uh sort of stretch of performances as like one of the primary reasons why the state of Kerala is a social democracy to this day. Um, and it's like a, a real life uh, example of like theater having a tangible impact on its, its community and like storytelling too. And which, so that in itself is wild. And, and I'm not saying like the solution is to just do that here, but I think there's lessons that could be learned from that of like, mm -hmm. um, uh, if you understand like storytelling and like traditions in your community, you can create art and like a, perf like a, a performance or, or whatever that like does have concrete impact on like the people around them. And so like in that sense, like film, understanding that like film is like the, the dominant form of storytelling in our current society, that's likely like, you know, the, the like form that, a story like that would have to take in America today. Mm -hmm. And how did you become a storyteller? Um, great question. Uh, well, I was definitely around it a lot growing up. Both my parents are writers. Um, and I've always found, it, I, I don't know. I find it very engaging to like, uh, it's, it's such a, human thing to like, you know, tell stories. I, I've always had like a big imagination when I was a kid, you know, I had all these, like, I had like Legos and, and Playmobil and action figures and all these different like forms of, you know, little dolls that you can, <laughs> you know, tell stories with. And I was always, I was always doing it. Um, and I don't think, but it took me a while to realize that was like a thing I wanted to do with my life. Um, I mean, I wanted to be an actor when I was in high school, I, I like discovered acting is like a, a thing that brought me joy. Um, but at the time it was partly ego driven. I liked being on stage and watched by all these people and being told that like I was to be seen or yeah, exactly. to be acknowledged. Okay. Yeah. And then it was also partly escapism because I was deeply unhappy with like the body and the life that I had. Um, and so when I was acting, I got to be somebody else and, and inhabit a different body and imagine what it would be like if I wasn't miserable all the time. And so that drove me into, I wanted to like be an actor in films. Um, and, but I went to school for theater acting, which is what they tell you to do. Um, and then in college, I like sort of fell in love with the theater, um, as like an art form. Uh, but I also learned that like acting wasn't necessarily for me for a couple of reasons. Number one, when I started transitioning, I stopped 
feeling as deep a need to act. And then the other was, um, I stopped getting cast as much in things at, at my school, they, uh, really at all. Um, cause they let me audition as a woman, but they, I, at the time was not very good at like convincingly inhabiting a woman's space. Um, uh, and they didn't really provide me any guidance or anything like that. So I basically just like had to figure out, well, what am I going to do with my time here if I'm not going to act? And so I discovered other things like directing, like writing, um, uh, dramaturgy, which is like sort of like being an encyclopedia on set or not on set, but like in, in a, you know, in a rehearsal space. Um, and, uh, found other ways basically to engage with storytelling. Um, and then the first time I wrote anything that got performed was this thing, this like 24 hour play festival where like I signed up for it as like either a director or a writer, I got assigned to be a writer and me and like three or four other people showed up at this like house just off campus. And we were like given, um, like a couple prompts and we wrote a, we were supposed to write like a 15 minute play overnight. And I wrote mine and I, I, I got just like the, the words were just like flowing. I wrote this like farce about sexually confused frat guys, um, and, uh, had just like the best time sent it off, uh, in the morning, you know, it got assigned to a group of actors and they like, and a director and they, they put it on. And then that, that, that next evening it was like performed in front of everybody. And just seeing this thing that I had written get taken by other people. And like, they brought their own interpretation to it and found things that I hadn't even considered and performed it. was a it. rush, right? It was such yeah. a rush. It was the biggest adrenaline rush I've ever had. And that was when I was like, oh, this is, this is what I want to do with my life. This is the most alive I've ever felt, you know? Mm -hmm. what about in terms of like going to school for um uh, for theater or like uh it was theater right yeah uh like what were some of the important things that in in hindsight that you you really learned from that i mean obviously there's the experiences of writing and working with other people but like are there like particular takeaways you might have from that period in time one of the biggest things i think i learned in school was I don't know if learned is the right word, but the skill that I honed in school was uh, drawing connections between things that don't, that seemingly aren't connected. Um, and like, like finding patterns and like, uh, and, and things like that. Um, I, I, and also like thinking critically and like really sort of like, cause when, when someone writes a play, for instance, especially like a play that's considered one of the greats or whatever, they're not just putting, they're not just like, maybe this would happen next. And then maybe this would happen next. They're doing things intentionally, like for, for a purpose. And, and if you look for that purpose, it's a really rewarding process. You learn a lot about, uh, not just the thing you're, you're learning about, but, or like that you're studying, but also yourself and about how you relate to the world and, and, uh, and so I think in a lot of ways, it's made me a more empathetic person. It's made me, um, a very insightful person. Um, and with like magic, for instance, one of my skills in magic, that's like somewhat intangible is like find like seeing sort of, um, uh, unintuitive lines and like find and like c catching little things that like, maybe like, you know, the average player might miss. And I think it's, there's, you can sort of draw a straight line between like analyzing like a literary text and analyzing a board state in terms of just like seeing the little like crannies of whatever, uh, and, and maximizing those things, you know? That's amazing. I've never heard anyone talk about like literary analysis and magic <laughs> in the same sentence. I'm so glad you said that. Like, this is, this is so cool. I, I'm just like in the moment right now. It's just like, uh, that is, that is really, really interesting. Yeah. Uh, definitely going to explore that more deeply. Uh, but I just want to stay on this, this, this beat a little bit. Like, mm -hmm. um, this is coming from my own curiosity because I, I, I don't think I'm a good writer, but I do tend to write more like nonfiction, if you could call it that, mm -hmm. just like, you know, just things about my own life or things like that. Like, how do you, this is like a very, like noob, noob question, but like, how do you l write fiction or how do you write stories where 
these people don't actually exist, but they exist on the page. Like what, what's the process to do that for you? Understanding, realizing that maybe everyone has a different process. Yeah. Well, I would say, first of all, in a sense, they do exist, you know, they like the best fiction that you could, that you've read, the people felt alive. They felt real, I think. Um, and yeah. in a lot, and in a somewhat literal sense, they were, I mean, like you, dr a lot of writers will draw directly from their own experience or the, pe the experience of people they know, but also, you know, it's, if you're thinking about people or, or like if you're creating a person out of thin air, you can ask yourself questions about them. And then you answer those questions. It's up to you, you know, what those answers are. And the more of those you answer, the more they come to life. Um, and the other thing is like people have a tendency to fill in the gaps themselves, you know, and like we like p human beings are naturally like pattern seekers, like, like the whole reason, like, you know, constellations exist is because human beings looked at the sky, saw shapes in the stars and drew meaning out of them. And, and in the same way, you know, when, when you write a, a, a book or, or in my case, like if in the short film I wrote, uh, one of my weaknesses as a writer is a, a desire to sort of explain everything and have it be as clear as possible. And something I've been trying to encourage myself to do and trying to learn and instill in myself is um, you don't have to do that. Like find the seed of whatever is true to you and, and nourish that seed and, and flesh it out. But also don't be afraid to like, let some stuff not be said because audience, you know, like the audience or the, the reader will fill in some of that gaps themselves. Um, the other thing I'll say is that I actually think that I'm a much stronger sort of master of rhetoric than I am like literature or anything like that. Like, I think that I'm like much better at just like crafting like sentences that sound good or look good than I am at like making like uh, writing like a story or like, or building a narrative in that regard. Um, which is part of why I think one of my strengths as a like magic writer, for instance, is I think that like the like articles I write are very well written. Um, is the insight better than, you know, the average pro who writes an article? Certainly not. I mean, I'm not as good as, you know, uh, like the reads and the, and the PVs or anything like that. Um, what I, what's somewhat unique about what I bring to the table is, um, is I am just, I know how to craft a sentence basically. And I, I love language. I'm just obsessed with one of my skills is just, or one of my, my interests, I guess, is just like, is, is language and, and what you can do with words and, and the power that, that you can have with them. So, so in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm someone with like a sort of rhetorical lens trying to write narrative, uh, stories. Um, just going back to what you said about the, the characters and letting the audience fill in the blanks like that resonates with me so much because mm. even when I watch works of fiction, like movies or stories in general, like I feel like nowadays we're also in this kind of world where we tend to want to have everything explained to us. So it's like, I yeah. would watch a movie that has an ambiguous ending. And now I would, my natural inclination is just to try to read some sort of analysis on the ending or, or watch some sort of explainer. But I think there's a certain joy in just kind of, uh, I know it's not quite what you said. Cause you're saying like, have the characters like, uh, filled out enough as constructs so that people can like fill the rest in. Right. But I'm also thinking in the context of like plot and like yeah. how some endings are left open-ended and it's like, now it's just. I always want things to be explained. I always want to know exactly why, like if there's a fade to black, like what actually happened. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. There's no question here, but I'm just trying to, I'm just like, I'm just thinking about that. Like, I think the best, I think it is better to have things that are intentionally ambiguous or just let me come to my own conclusions. But in a way it's like my mind has been beaten down where I don't want that anymore. So it's kind of, yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of strange. It's like, I, I'm sure as an artist, it's like, you have to deal with like the, the balance of being too literal versus like making people, 
it's kind of like the whole teaching a person to fish versus like fishing for them. Yeah. And I don't know how you think about that in your, in your work. That's definitely a, that's a very good point. And I think that is like sort of a trend of society. You see all these like YouTube videos of like X movie with an ambiguous ending explained. Um, I will say like, as an artist, I have a, I, I, I don't, I don't love that trend. Um, I, even though I, I fully understand it and I, I experienced the same thing. I, uh, recently watched, um, uh, the movie Mulholland drive, uh, at the recommendation of, uh, Brad Nelson. Uh, and, um, that's a classic example of a movie that doesn't really make a lot of sense. But, uh, afterwards, uh, I was watching it with, uh, my friend, with Andrew Ellen Bogan, uh, my, uh, and we were like talking about it. Uh, and rather than like, we, we, we were both a bit bewildered by the end of it, but then rather than like, you know, uh, I, I felt the impulse to look up an expla explanation of it, but then I decided instead, what if we like just talk through it and what, what do we know? Like, you know, um, and, uh, and that process was actually extremely enjoyable. Just like, and maybe we didn't fully grasp the truth or whatever, but maybe there is no truth. And maybe the truth that we landed on is good enough. Um, and I think that there's, I think that most people would enjoy that if they stretch that muscle a little bit more. Um, but we don't, we aren't really asked to ever. Everything is always so, yeah, just like all the Marvel movies and all that stuff. Everything is so explained. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no mystery. There's no filling in the, the blanks ourselves. Um, and I do find that a bit tiring, but I also don't yeah. think that's a hundred percent of story stories these days. I think there are still very inventive and like very, um, there are still some open-ended things out there, but, um, and when I do it, when we, when I come across those, I do feel a bit like, you know, mm -hmm. breath of fresh air. Do you feel an impetus at all, like in your work to subvert expectations? Hmm. I would say no, mostly because I don't think as much about expectations when I'm writing. Maybe, and maybe that's a mm. thing that I would benefit from doing more of, but I don't, I think I, I have a couple, I don't know. I think subverting expectations simply for the sake of subverting expectations is not a very strong choice in storytelling. And I think that, um, mm. uh, subverting expectations sort of by nature of telling the story you want to tell and recognizing that sort of twists and changes happen in life and finding a way to lead to those things is, um, uh, is often a more like substantive method for accomplishing the same thing. That said, there is something about the subversion of expectations that is like really just like joyful and, and pleasing to humans. It stemming back to like peekaboo, you know, like, Oh, where did they go? Oh, they're back. You know, like, ah, <laughs> you know, like that, like in a sense, like all the, um, like the M night Shyamalan plot twists and all that stuff are just sort of complex games of peekaboo. Um, and I think people do like that. So I think there's definitely like a space for like the memento style of storytelling. I just think that those are not as like filling as a lot of the other forms of, of storytelling. And I do, I will say I like, I'm, am sort of in the process of working on a play that does have a bit of a twist ending and I'm in, and I'm aware of that and I'm sort of building around that twist. Um, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't say it's like a primary thing that I think about when I'm writing. Mm -hmm. By the way, the reason I asked that is like, just because uh, of two things, like you mentioned, uh, uh, Mulholland drive, right. Watching that movie like that, uh, excuse my language, that language, that movie is just an utter mind fuck. Like yes. there's no, like I can, I don't think anyone really understands what it's about. But I think that's the point that it is about like subjectivity. Um, by the way, I, I know Andrew's a smart guy, so Andrew Allen Bogan. So it's like I'm sure between the two of you, you must have figured out like. 90%. I feel pretty good about our our interpretation. 
<laughs> um, but secondly, I asked the question because you mentioned having that play where, you know, you, you had that audience participation, mm. like breaking the fourth wall. And I don't know if you, I think I understand like intentionality for you. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it's like, it's not about subverting expectations, but it's about delivering a kind of message or delivering a kind of complicity with the audience. Mm -hmm. And that is the point more than just like, oh, I'm going to give you a twist, right? That's yeah. not what that's about. So it's, it's different. Well, I do also think like, uh, if sometimes a twist is necessary to accomplish a certain thing you want to do. And I also say like, yeah, I, uh, I am particularly a fan of twists that once they happen, you're like, oh, it couldn't have happened any other way. Of course, that's how it had to go down, you know? And, uh, uh, and I think that like, from a writing perspective, um, well, I, I, I think there are some ways that things could happen, like the ways that events could occur that are more powerful if the audience is blindsided by them. And so in that way, like setting up a twist is like super valuable. Um, like, uh, I'm going to spoil the movie Fight Club, uh, for example. Um, okay, if you've been living in a cave and you didn't yeah. know that like Darth Vader was Luke's father or you haven't exactly. watched Night Club, then yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, spoiler I, alert. Exactly. Spoiler <laughs> alert for the movie from 1999. All right, here we go. Uh, uh, when, when it's revealed that Tyler Durden is the narrator, um, the movie is so much worse if you know that from the beginning, right? And like, mm -hmm. and so like, there are certainly like things that like twists that happen and like stories that, that are worth telling that involve twists and, and those twists are necessary. Um, there's a thing that's, that's taught in, um, or was taught in my, uh, uh, the very first, one of the very first classes I took in college, which was called survey and analysis of dramatic literature. And it's sort of this class was like pretty foundational to like where I am today as a person. And it was the exercise of taking these like set of texts, uh, like, like theatrical, you know, things like, like fences, for instance, or angels in America, like these, these brilliant, brilliant pieces of art, um, and figuring out what the heck was going on in any of these. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and there's a moment in many plays, um, in many stories, not just plays, but like any, uh, st like story that like, uh, called a reversal, which is when a moment when everything that the main character thought was true is flipped on its head. And um, when that happens, the character has two choices. They can either accept the reversal or they can reject the reversal. And then that choice determines what happens in the end. But so sort of by nature, twists are like a human part of storytelling. And they happen to us all the time when we think we know something and then all of a sudden our entire world. Yeah. Shifts. I was just going to say, that's kind of like real life, isn't it? Yeah. And there's, it's a reason, there's a reason that that's a thing that is sort of baked into so many storytelling things. But yeah, the, the moment of reversal is, uh, I think, uh, uh, like, I don't know. It's, it's everywhere in storytelling. Um, and so in a lot of sense, even movies or even stories that don't have like twist endings will have a twist. If you like, if you like, think about it. Right. So Jesse, going back to stress fracture, would you say that the fulfillment comes from actually doing the work as opposed to having a deliverable at the end? If I'm reading correctly into kind of what you've been telling me, uh, so far, I, I, is that a, is that a safe assumption? So you mean by like making the movie is the, is the goal not to have a thing at the end? Yeah. Making the movie is the point or is yeah. it like actually delivering it and having people uh, watch it and give you feedback and like goes into their consciousness, that kind of thing. I mean, that's a great question. Um, while I'm making it, making it is the goal. Once I've finished it, delivering it will become the goal. Um, and I, I have, you know, I have been asked a few times, like, particularly by people like sort of outside of the film spheres, um, like what the point is of making a short film like this? Is it a stepping stone to a greater thing or is it a end goal in and of itself? I mean, and the answer is it may turn out to be a stepping stone, but that's not, and, and that may be like, you know, a super objective that I have while doing it. But my primary goal 
And the thing I'm trying to really like focus on is I want, I want to tell this particular story and this is, I think the best way to tell the story. And, um, I'm, I, I want to challenge myself to tell the story as well as I can. Um, and so I think the best way to be disappointed by the outcome of this film that I'm making would be to develop too many expectations for what the end product will look like and what the end product will do for me long term. Mm. I the worst case it would be terrible if I created a short film that I was really proud of and that I felt like really accomplished what I wanted to what I set out to accomplish when when doing it. And then I like didn't get into festivals that I wanted to get into, like like film festivals. Or I got into some festivals and nobody super important saw it and like no I made no connections out of it or you know it didn't further my career that it would be pretty sad pretty miserable honestly to feel bad about the thing I had created if if the thing I had created was something that otherwise I would have been quite proud of and so what I'm trying to do is treat the creation of this as its own thing and I'm going to I'm going to learn a lot from this experience I'm going to challenge myself a lot with this experience and I hopefully will create something that, that I'm very proud of at the end of it. And then once I've done that, then I can start thinking about, okay, now I have this little like object that I've created and I will try to like, I'll walk around showing it to people and hopefully people enjoy it or get something out of it. Um, and maybe a couple of the people I show it to are like, wow, that's a really cool little like trinket you've made there. I would love to help you make more and then I would get to make more and I would get to like spend my life making little, like little sculptures of, you know, story. And, um, and that would be amazing. Um, but that's sort of, I'm trying to treat that as like a separate process from the thing that I'm doing right now, which is making the movie. Yeah. I think that's the way to do it. Right. Cause like in the moment you need it to be just about making it, you can't just you, like, if you get too wrapped up on all the other things before you've actually done it, I think that's just tough, right? Yeah, and there's there's a phenomenon in, in like football, for instance, of like uh, a wide receiver catches or is like the ball is coming at a wide receiver. They have their hands out. It's coming right at their hands, and then they yeah. drop it. And and the and the reason for that is because they've turned They're to look up the field. Next, the next move. Right? Yeah, they've yeah. turned they they've turned their head to look up field. They lost track of the ball. They don't catch it. They drop it. Um, and whereas if they had finished catching the ball finish securing the ball and then turn to look at it. Maybe they would have gotten decked by the defender coming up. But like, if they don't, that, that that's just like a much safer way to like, you know, do it. Mm -hmm. And so in a similar sense, I am going to spend, like my energy is focused right now on, on tracking the ball, making sure my hands are in the right spot, doing everything I can, getting in the right position. Um, and then once I've caught it, then I can figure out how to get it, you know, to the end zone or whatever. <laughs> yeah. No, I, that, that's something really relatable to me because like, for me, that's kind of like my creator dilemma, which is like in the moment, even recording something like this podcast or writing something, I love it so much. Like I love this, like this real timeness of us doing it right now. Mm -hmm. But then there's also like the greed, uh, the greedy part of me, which is like, well, I want as many people as possible to listen to this interview as well. <laughs> so how do I like structure this in a way that it could have the most appeal because if I, if I'm already doing it, I might as well try to market it for like as many people as possible. Because like, let's say that three people listen to this interview and really love it, but I would still rather maybe have like 3000 people listen to it. And then, and then like, maybe like I lose like 90% of them, like in the first 10 minutes, cause we're not talking about magic, mm -hmm. but, but then, um, but then there's still going to be like a larger population that will be like, Hey, humans and magic is pretty cool. Like I want to hear more about Jesse or I want to like hear more future episodes with other people. Mm -hmm. So it's like, for me, it's always like the tough part is like, I know as a creator, I shouldn't care about a lot of these secondary things, but I kind of can't help it. And, like, and it so does it's really, matter. it's really hard. Yeah. yeah. It does matter. Right. Like, like you can't write just for example, like maybe taking a really this might be a bad example, but like if you're writing a magic article, it has to be about magic. You can't start putting in like film references or like go crazy because like there's a certain expectation that the audience has and you can't like subvert that too much. But yeah. at the end of the day, like you still have to have that mass appeal, but it's like 
how do you draw the line? Right? So when you make a short film, like you have your, your integrity, your intentions, the message you want, but then I don't know, there might be a part of you that's thinking about like, how will this be received? Like, how do I market the movie? Like, I know you're saying you're focused on doing it, but I, I have to assume you've been thinking about that, even if you're, you're doing it right. Yeah. That's a really good point. So I guess it is somewhat of a lie to say that I'm not in any way thinking about like what, what, uh, the no, I'm sorry. Part. I'm not trying to I say know you're not, but it is true. Yeah. I, but it is somewhat of a lie, I think, uh, or not a lie made so much as like an incomplete truth. Um, because there are considerations I've made for festivals and things like that already. For instance, um, uh, it's much better to have a shorter film than a longer film when your goal is to get into like film festivals, the way it's sort of described is like, if you, if a festival has, let's say like an hour of, of time to fill with short films, um, that's sort of set in stone. And then it's like, okay, well I could put four 15 minute short films in this thing, or I could put, you know, uh, like six, 10 minute ones or 10, six minute ones. And so they are thinking about like, how do I, like if two films are equally good, but one of them is shorter, the shorter one almost always will be the one that's like selected for these sorts of things. Um, which is tough because very, very few writers like telling short, very, very short stories. We, we are storytellers because we love to talk and we love to, you know, we love to fill <laughs> space to develop concepts. Exactly. Yeah. And so, um, like for instance, I wrote a short film, about a year ago that I at one point thought I was going to film, but it was 30 pages long. It was 30 minutes long, which I thought is like, that's a nice short story, you know, <laughs> uh, or, or you feel like that's the right length for that story. That well, yeah. Tell, right. And I, and I felt like it was the right length for that story. Um, but then I learned, Oh, that's not how it really works. Practically speaking, you know? And so this new story I wrote, um, it started out like around 18, 19 pages. And even that felt like, you know, I was really trying to truncate it. Um, and the, my process, my editing process has involved trying to cut that down. Um, and, uh, so I have now gotten it under 15 pages, which means it will be under 15 minutes, which is right. Like that's sort of the upper limit of like a, like, you know, a short film that's viable for a festival. So I definitely am making some considerations for that. I'm also, when I'm saying I'm focusing on making this, you know, I am trying to make it as good a product as possible. And so a lot of the same choices that would be involved in optimizing for sort of the, the like marketing aspect of it and, uh, thinking about your audience and stuff like that are also involved in like how to make it better. So for instance, like I'm someone who loves dialogue as you might be able to guess from this conversation. Um, and, uh, and so I like. I have a tendency to keep writing diet. Like I keep like, you know, a character will like say the same thing three times, three different ways, because I feel like that creates, I'm like forever tormented by the imperfection of language. And the fact that like, you can't really express some abstract ideas in like a single sentence. Um, and I'm constantly trying to like, uh, to, to borrow, you know, an old, uh, fable. I'm trying to describe the elephant in as many ways as possible. Um, and, uh, I, in, in, in plays, you can do that a little bit more, but really in any sort of, in any form of storytelling, you don't want to do that. That's not how people talk normally, you know, outside of like interviews on, you know, <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> yes. I would say like, I, like another part of my editing process has involved just going and being like, Oh, I've said the same thing three times there. Let's say that in a single word or like, you know, a single sentence, or maybe the character thinks this, but they don't say it here. Like maybe that's just a thought in their head instead. Um, and, and a classic, like sort of critique in, um, when you're like reading, uh, someone else's work and you're giving them feedback. One of the classic things is like, what are the characters not saying? Because writers often have a tendency to like spell everything out, but people all the time have thoughts in their head. They don't share. And so it's, much more interesting oftentimes to write a scene, a piece of dialogue between two people where they're saying there's a conversation here that's happening verbally. And then there's a conversation here that's not happening, but both characters are thinking and you can feel like the energy. 
Um, so anyway, part of my process has involved cutting down my dialogue as much as possible, which makes it stronger and then also will make it better. It, it will make people like it more. So it's sort of, there's a lot of, narr there are a lot of like uh, objectives that um, uh, are sort of synchronistic in that, re in that regard. How do you develop a self-awareness to edit your work that way? Because I have found when I'm <laughs> doing my own writing and that it's really hard, like, because really you have to be your own harshest critic, but how do you develop that self-awareness in the first place? It's hard. Um, and I don't think I'm perfect. I'm, no, I'm nowhere near like where I, I have a lot well, of room to is. grow, I'm sure. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but one of the ways I've learned is, um, well, number one, I would say, uh, a nice thing is I generally have approached, I approach the act of creation with very little ego, I think, um, and very little like preciousness. Um, I, uh, I'm one of my skills is, um, in like critique settings, if I am extremely open to other people's feedback and their thoughts. And if they, uh, it, it very rarely hurts my feelings, um, to hear negative feedback. Um, and so I, similarly, I, when I'm in editing, when I'm so I sort of have like two different brains. I have like writing, creating brain, and then I have editing, cutting brain. Um, and, uh, when I'm in editing brain, I try, I almost take like, I, I do my best to like take them sort of other, I, I try to, in, in the same way that when you're writing and when you're, when you're tell, like creating a character, you try to put yourself in their head. I try to put myself in the head of an audience member and try to think like what, what's actually necessary. And for the first couple attempts, I don't always, I, I often don't catch everything or, or maybe even many things. Um, but the more times I go over it, the more I become aware of the moments that aren't working. And, and then to some extent, there's also sort of like a, uh, a certain je ne sais quoi about like, oh, like I can just feel like the vibes tell me this is wrong or the vibes tell me this is right. Um, and so learning to trust that voice is also part of the process. Mm -hmm. What's your, um, process for like getting in a good state of mind to do writing or to do editing? Like, do you have certain rituals or routines that you, that you follow? Like, I, I guess the, the stereotypical one is like, uh, certainly for me, what worked in the past is like, you try to do it writing first thing in the morning. And, uh, if you're a morning person, I don't know if you are, but like, what are some rituals or routines that have worked well for you? I don't really have exactly, I don't like have any one that always works or that I always turn to. Um, but a sort of collection, I have like a, a basket of tools and I, sometimes I grab one and it ends up being the wrong tool. Um, but examples of these tools are like, uh, setting aside time to do it and then sitting down and, and forcing yourself to just like do it. And if you don't produce anything out of that time, I'm a firm believer that that's okay. I think part of the writing process is like, staring at a blank page and like banging your head against the wall and like mm. you were gonna have to do that eventually to get through that spot so it's it's productive time even if it only results in like a single sentence um mm -hmm. sometimes like having a little a fun drink you know something to, <laughs> to sip on as a little treat like a, sometimes it's tea sometimes like you know a, a sweet drink or something um yeah. instrumental music or or music of some kind that I'm like particularly familiar with so that I'm not like thinking as much about the words, um, going to another location, like a coffee shop or something like will sometimes trick the mind into being more productive. Um, sometimes it's time of day. I really, one of my favorite things is like sitting on the floor with the coffee, t with my coffee table in front of me and writing on my laptop there that like makes me feel very engaged. Um, and then other times it's like, if I feel inspired to do it, I try to listen to that as much as possible. Very rarely have I ever said no to myself when my brain is like, oh, you have an idea and, and you want to write. Um, yeah. and, Even at 2 a.m. Exactly. when you have that dialogue, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, and 
yeah, so that, those are the main things. Um, I often try to be, like, very comfortable, like, you know, big sweater, sweatpants or something. Um, I really like writing in, like, my favorite hoodie with, like, my hood up, for instance. Like, just – and having a number of these things makes it a lot easier to write, I think, because they don't – they aren't always effect- – they aren't all effective all the time. And so mm-hmm. you can sort of get a sense of, like, what, what do I need in this moment to, like, make me creative? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's no guarantee that, like, because I, I think I think questions like this are often flawed because one day they make someone listening to suppose that I could like somehow copy Jesse's methods and it would work and yeah. it probably doesn't because we're so uh, different you know, every person. But also like it it is a kind of tweaking and trial and error and there's a kind of um, falseness to this kind of certainty that people say like if you only do X Y and Z you're going to become like a winning magic player or you're gonna like be able to write this play like in 10 simple steps or something like that right yeah so uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's a range i guess if i were to like give advice to somebody who has been wanting to write more but hasn't like gotten themselves to do it is to like is to i think the first step is to get in tune with yourself and figure out what it is about writing that you found challenging like maybe it's distraction and in, in which case you need to like like turn off twitter like like don't open twitter or like you know turn your phone off or whatever. Maybe it's time of day or like you just never have time. And that means you have to like carve out time. Like it's really a personal thing, but step one is, is asking yourself, what is the thing preventing me from doing this? Um, and this is not true of just of writing. It's true of everything that anytime you have like an issue of like, man, I really wish I just like did this. Let's say it's like, I really wish I, you know, was better at doing laundry. That's an example that I'm, I'm, not great at, um, you know, consistently keeping up with my laundry. And, uh, one of the issues is like, uh, I, the the process itself is so taxing (laughs) and uh, (laughs) a suggestion that I was once told by somebody was, uh, part of it's like, like, you know, I have this basket and there's a bunch of clothes in there, but you can't wash all of them at once because I have like some white clothes and some, you know, dark clothes. Uh, and, uh, they were like, well, what if you just had two separate baskets, one for like white clothes and one for dark clothes. And that way, when one fills up, you can do that, but you don't have to like, you know, do the process of like pulling them out and like all that stuff. Yeah. And it up. or sorting. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Or like, for instance, flossing is a challenge for a lot of people. For me, it's because like I'm sleepy at night. I don't want to take extra time to floss, you know? <laughs> and so the suggestion, Relatable. yeah, the suggestion offered is like, floss in the middle of the day instead, you know, like, Mm -hmm. uh, there's no, there's no rule that says you have to floss at nighttime, you know, find Mm -hmm. a time when you aren't tired (laughs) to do it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just like things like that, finding ways to like, ask yourself why you're not doing it and then, and then address the, the reason that you're not doing it rather than forcing yourself or like beating yourself up for not doing it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned having a drink. My new thing is like, have a drink at noon. It's like, because supposedly According to a book I read, like why we sleep, it's like, you know, when you don't get as high quality of a sleep, if you, if you have an alcohol, like too close to going to bed, because mm. it's still in your body, even though you feel like you, you just collapse and you just had a deep sleep, like it's not actually a higher quality sleep. Mm. So, but they say it takes alcohol, I don't know, like seven or eight hours or something, same as oh caffeine to leave your system. So it's like, if you just want to enjoy a drink, like obviously it's hard for some people with their schedules, but I've thought about just, I, I have been trying like just, just drink at noon because like <laughs> by the time you go to bed, like it'll be gone. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not really that's a great uh, idea. That's not really a life hack. It's just like, I don't know. It's just like my interpretation <laughs> of that science. Yeah. So humans of magic yeah. official stance, drink at noon. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I mean, I'm taking that with caffeine as well. It's like, try to have it in the a.m. Because yeah. like, if you have it in the afternoon, chances are it'll still be in your system by the time like 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. rolls around. So, yeah. um, but if you go to bed super late at 2 a.m., then it won't matter. So it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just want to ask like, uh, the last thing about stress fracture, like what would you consider to be like, a quote unquote success. Do you think of it that way? Like, is it getting into a film festival? Is it getting some sort of recognition? I know you're still in the process of making it, but, Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a goal? Is is it, is the goal of the point? Like, I'm not actually sure after this, uh, 
series of uh, back and forth. So yeah, I think I think there's a few goals. Um, I have a friend who recently uh, made his own short film. They shot it last summer, and they are very very close. I think he described the like if there's like a video game completion percent bar, he's at like 95 percent now, um, and uh, he does kind of a wonderful thing where like every milestone along the way he has celebrated um and i think i i I want to like sort of adopt that attitude myself because every milestone is a sort of accomplishment in and of itself for instance we we launched our fundraising uh three days ago as of the recording of this podcast and um in the first 24 hours we reached over half our goal our budget was fifteen thousand dollars um and now as of uh you know, the current, uh, like, uh, as of like this moment, we are at, uh, let's see, we are less than a thousand dollars away, um, from finishing funding the movie. And now we may go over because that would give us a lot more freedom to, uh, to, you know, we could like film on an extra day and things like that. Um, but the fact that like we set what we thought was a stretch goal and we're like hitting it so so quickly is is really really wild, and I feel ex- extremely like grateful of the support of uh, the people in my life. I have some truly wonderful people um, uh, rooting for me, and um, yeah, I'm extremely lucky in that regard. Um, but that's so like even just launching the campaign was a success, like you know. Being where we're at right now, I think it's a success. When we finish filming, uh, a example of like what success looks like for that would be like if I feel like we got all the shots we needed, and um, I feel good about like we have the raw material. We've we've successfully mined uh, the raw material needed to you know splice together and craft a a story, a cohesive story. Um, sort of cutting forward when it's finished if i like it it'll have been a success um and from there that's the most important thing is whether or not i like it at the end and then additional successes beyond that is um you know if other people like it if we get into like festivals um I haven't done a lot of research into festivals because, you know, I'm trying to keep my eye on the ball right now, but like, I'm sure there are festivals that are better to get into than others. And if we get into those sort of like more prestigious ones, that's a success. And then if the reception at these festivals is positive, that would also be a success. But, um, I have often found myself constantly thinking about the things I don't have and the things that I want career wise. And it makes the things that I currently have feel less, important and valuable. And so I'm trying to reframe my brain so that I don't do that as much. And instead of, um, because like, let's say you're climbing a mountain, the view at the top is good, but if you don't enjoy the climb and you don't stop and take stock of where you are, you are not, uh, you're never gonna be happy. And like, if you climb the mountain and you, you appreciate the view for a minute, then you have to climb back down and eventually you're like, well, now I have to climb another mountain. It's it, it, the, the goalposts keep moving. And, and I think that, um, a thing I'm trying to sort of instill in myself is an appreciation of the current moment. And the fact that I'm happy, busy, engage, having engaging conversation, like right before recording this podcast, uh, my roommate is the, is the, uh, production designer doing all the sets and all the costumes for, uh, this film. And we were having a meeting before this podcast episode and, uh, just like what a, what an incredibly joyful thing to like have this other artist that I'm like having this like conversation about the story that we're trying to tell together, um, and how best to convey, you know, the story through color and space, um, and costume. And, uh, so the fact that I'm happy is a success in my mind. Um, and hopefully I'm happy on set. (laughs) If not, Mm -hmm. I'll have to reevaluate what I want to do with my life. (laughs) (laughs) And also like the view at the top of the mountain is fleeting too. Yes. It's like, it could be the most enjoyable thing, but that's probably like 
five percent of your life, right? Yeah. Is like when you hit when you hit that milestone. I know you said like celebrate milestones. I think that is important. But how much of your life is spent celebrating milestones versus climbing? I think most of it is climbing. Yeah. So you have to enjoy the climb because like that view is just also fleeting before you decide to go down or to climb that next mountain, right? Yeah. And so like something I talk about a lot in therapy, I um is uh because I grapple with this a lot of, of not appreciating like what I have right now. Um, and, uh, so something about my career as a playwright is I've never had a full length theatrical production, um, yet, uh, I'm 27 years old. That's like not super abnormal. I think for someone in my spot, if I had had, you know, a couple by now, that would be very early in a career. However, I haven't had it. And there's a lot of like gates that open once you have had one of those. Um, and, uh, and it's very easy to be like, man, like nothing I've done up to this point matters because I haven't had that production yet. But then it's something, an exercise I've been doing is, okay, now I'm imagining, let's say I have a, per, uh, like full length professional production. Okay. Now all of a sudden it's like, well, I've never like, you know, been nominated for an award. And then it's like, okay, let's imagine I have, or like, I've never had a production on Broadway or off Broadway or in New York. Uh, and let's say I get those and then all of a sudden, okay, well now I've, I've never been nominated for a Tony. Oh, okay. Well, I've never won a Tony. Okay. Well, uh, anyone can win a Tony. I need to win. Never won know. an Academy Award. Exactly. Like, oh, I don't even have an EGOT. Like, you know, when am I going to get a Grammy? I don't even sing, you know? So like, <laughs> uh, it's so easy to measure yourself by what you don't have. And something I learned in my transition, and I highly recommend everybody apply this to their life is, um, early on, I would get, I would feel really disappointed because I hadn't accomplished parts of my transition that I wanted to accomplish. I was like, I don't look the way I want to look. I don't, I don't, you know, I haven't, uh, I, I'm just not the person I, I thought I would be by now or the person that I hope to be in, ten, in like a year or two years or five years. Um, what I learned to do instead of that, because I was sort of miserable all the time, despite you know, making strides in my transition is I started trying to look backwards instead of forwards and compare myself to where I have been rather than where I am, wh where I want to go. Um, and the reason I do that is, is sort of twofold. Number one, you don't actually know where you're going to go. So you can't compare yourself to future you. That person doesn't exist yet. Um, and it's unfair to hold yourself to standards of someone who has had more time than you, more experience than you, and who may never fully never exist the way you think they will. It's a very easy way to beat yourself up and it doesn't actually help you. And then number two, you are like, we are by and large, almost always better off now than we were in the past. Um, in a lot of, you know, I guess I shouldn't speak so declaratively, but like, uh, and so when I, when I like, it's like, okay, I, I think have, that's true in the aggregate. Yeah. yeah I think that's true. And generally. so like, like, it's like, okay, I, um, where am I, you know, a year into, into, uh, getting hormones, it's like, okay, a year ago, I hadn't started hormones yet. That's a huge, like, wow, look at this thing I've accomplished. And so in general, I find looking backwards instead of forwards when it comes to like evaluating where you are is just, it's so much better for you. And that's actually a little bit counterintuitive, right? Because I think we're all, I shouldn't say we're all, but at least I'm sort of conditioned to always be like self-critical and thinking about the future, you know, if I have like this many listeners for humans of magic, like, can I get to the next milestone? It's just the way I'm wired at least. Yeah. So it's very like counterintuitive to go, go back. Um, but I also think like going back to something you said at the very beginning, the fact that you've gone through these challenges in your transition journey, or like you've done hard things in the past that you came out of, um, and you're still standing right as Jesse, like that's gotta be a huge booster. Like you should be able to tap into what you've done, right? Like, cause everything in life is kind of like a building up from the past. Right. And I know that some people may have had difficult pasts, so it's like, maybe you don't want to draw on that reservoir, but some, like if you selectively, um, celebrate your past wins, that's gotta be a good thing. Right. At least for me, it's like when I'm going through hard times, like I told you before the recording, I had a pretty difficult time last year, um, professionally and otherwise, like I have to kind of lean on like good self-talk and just telling myself, like, I've done it before and I can do it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And it also, it, yeah, I, <laughs> it's funny you say that because, um, literally yesterday I had therapy and I, I told my therapist, I was like, I hope that 
you know, let's say 20 years down the future, I'm like dying in a climate apocalyptic event. Um, I hope that like, as that's happening, it, it, when I'm miserable, I can think back on this time in my life when I was largely happy and, and, and largely doing, spending my time the way I want to spend it and with the people I want to spend it with. And she was like, she, she was like, yeah, I, I hope the same thing. Like, you know, when I'm, let's say I'm being tortured by like, you know, fascistic, uh, warlords in a, in a climate apocalypse. I hope I think back on this conversation that I had with an interesting person and, and I, I feel a little bit better knowing at one point in time I was happy. I think there's, you know, that's, these are both extreme examples, but, but in general, it's not that you should live in the past, but, but remind, like, even if past you is happier, that's like, you know, that's not, that's at least something to, to cling to. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Wishing gears a little bit. Um, how do you get good at magic? <laughs> how did you get good at magic? My answer would be you lose a lot and you pay attention. Um, and you approach it with a sort of blank slate. I mean, I, for a very long time and honestly still now, I, although somewhat less to a lesser extent these days, for a long time, I approached magic like I, I have my opinions and my thoughts about what's true, but I also am highly aware of like I'm new to this. Uh, to those who don't know, I've been playing magic since uh, Guilds of Ravnica and and toward the end of 2018, so not very long. Um, and uh, I basically approach it with with the same way I approach like for instance. Um, getting critiques on something I've written. It, I, I'm not very precious about my ideas and I'm prepared to be wrong. Um, so just in general, the way I am, I, I'm a fast learner and I'm also like a very alert person, I would say in general. So like when I, um, when I would lose, I would often figure out why, um, uh, and then I would try not to do that. And so I would try to use my losses um, uh, to, you know, in general, I, I just, I really don't like making the same mistake twice. And so I, I try to, in general, uh, just like think about why certain things happened and how do I avoid those things happening again? What draws you to the magic today? Um, it's a very intricate game. Um, and I like that there's no right answers. And in a lot of the time, like you can make a play that feels optimal, but you, everyone in magic for the most part is working under imperfect information all the time. And there's infinite permutations of like cards that could exist or whatever. And so in that sense, playing magic, I guess, is a lot like, you know, telling stories or evaluating a piece of literature like you don't it's drawing conclusions based on incomplete and imperfect information and it's it's solving a puzzle there's a part of me that definitely has like a very analytical brain and like so solving puzzles i find very very uh, engaging uh and then also it's just cool i don't know i like fantasy guys i like swords i like you know <laughs> uh big scary monsters and um and I, I love sitting down across the table from someone and I am going to do everything in my power to beat them. And they're going to do the same to me and we'll find out who wins. And the experience of beating somebody who has done everything they can to beat you and failed is somewhat intoxicating, I would say. How do you feel about the storytelling in magic as a storyteller yourself? Like, how do you assess analyze look at it with a critical eye like the the that part of magic like the lore yes i think there's a lot there that's really interesting and i think there's a lot that's phoned in and you know utmost respect for amen to that yeah <laughs> sorry to interrupt your answer <laughs> yeah i have the utmost respect for everyone that works on the story side of magic and i think and i understand that like it's a game first and foremost, and you know, it's a, well, no, it's a money-making tool first and foremost. Se it's a game second mm -hmm. and second most. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it's a story on top of that. And uh, uh, 
I don't really, honestly, I like vaguely keep up with the story, particularly if there's like a storyline that I think is interesting. I was like interested, for instance, in how these like beloved characters became completed in Brexia All Will Be One. And so I like read the magic story. I was somewhat disappointed, <laughs> I will say. Um, <laughs> but you don't have to sugarcoat it. You don't have to use the word somewhat. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. I, um, so I don't know. I, I don't really engage with the magic story that much. Um, I am vaguely interested in it, but I think I'm more interested in it conceptually than practically. I think that, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm more drawn. I, I'm definitely like interested in the story, in like broad strokes of magic. But I, I don't think the execution is good enough that I, that it's worth paying that much attention to. And there's mm -hmm. enough stories that are good out there that it's not that big of a deal to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know, I know you're, I knew you were Spike. So, and I'm a Spike as well. So it's like I ask oh, you the yeah. question about stories and lore, and like I don't pay attention to that stuff. So it's just like, I just, I just, I was just curious. That's all. It is, it yeah. is interesting because I have thought like. Is is like writing magic story like a thing that I would enjoy with my life? And I think the answer might be I, I would be down to be like a writer in the like uh, season two of the Netflix magic show. <laughs> like that would be like something I'm down for. Um, yeah. But I don't think that like writing the the like mothership or whatever like the wizards uh, the story that goes on on the website uh, that doesn't seem like a thing that I would enjoy very much. Um, but yeah, I think that in general, people get really upset about the story being bad. And I'm just like, I, like, I guess, but like, I don't know. It just doesn't matter that much to me. It's, it's like Pulp Fiction, really. I mean, not, not the movie, but like, it's, it's really just like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ma mass fiction, right? So, I mean, I don't know what you can expect out of, um, I'm probably going to have people hate me for this, but like some sort of like young, young adult, like storyline, like it's, it's totally fine. It does what it's supposed to do. Right. So. Yeah. And I, I think that, like, the story on the cards is plenty for me. Like, I think, I like that my cards tell a story, but I don't think that the, the supplemental material is all that necessary. That's exactly what I was thinking about as you were talking about um, writing characters, right? It's like, mm -hmm. you just give them enough so that people can fill in the blanks. In fact, I'm kind of like the old school magic player where it's like, I, I liked it when the lore was just in the flavor text. Like, mm -hmm. I had to draw my own conclusions. I had to, like, figure things out fill in the blanks but now it's like when things are spelled out for me like I, have to, I can read this novel about Gideon and Liliana like I I, I don't think I really want to do that because no. I'm going to be disappointed like it's yeah. it's like the explainer video for me you know yeah exactly yeah the, the Gideon and Liliana that exist in your head are far more interesting that's right that's right um yeah so Jesse thank you so much for your time um yeah how can people find you on the internet or do you want to like plug again your projects and the, yeah the sure links and all that stuff yeah yeah so so obviously you can follow me on twitter at titty pills ti double dy pi double ls i've gotten a lot better at saying that aloud um <laughs> the first time i <laughs> attempted I, I butchered it um mm. i if you like hearing me talk i am a regular um contributor to the uh mtg grindcast uh uh the quote spikiest podcast and all of uh Central Car Northern Carolina. Uh, sorry, sorry, Chris. I uh, I don't remember exactly the tagline. Anyway, um, so I do that. I'm I'm on that once a month. Um, I also I write articles for Channel Fireball and scripts for Tulane Community College. Uh, and I have a Patreon. You can find that at Patreon.com/slash Titty Pills, spelled the same way. Um, that's where I write a lot about basically any deck that I work on, especially uh, the Underworld Breach deck, uh, combo deck. Um, so you can follow me there. And, uh, as far as outside of magic goes, um, I, uh, am a, like, you know, you can find my work. Well, hopefully you'll be able to watch my movie at some point in the not too distant future. But if you would like to support the movie, any way that you would like to support the movie would be great. Um, you can follow me on Instagram at Jesse Robkin. That's my name, uh, spelled the way that my name is spelled. Um, and, uh, you can, financially support uh stress fracture if you would like to by um I, I don't know if the indiegogo will still be available um by the time this uh launches but um i guess it's a sort of a long url but it's on my twitter account um maybe it could be on like a you know in the description of this uh and then 
or you can just PayPal me <laughs> if you want to, uh, <laughs> or reach out to me on Twitter and be like, Hey, I want to help stress fracture. Um, yeah. So that works. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I, I think you're, uh, okay. I lied. That wasn't the last question. The really, the last question was, um, it seems like your Patreon is, I, I'm happy to see that you're doing well with the, the Patreon stuff. Like, is, is that going well overall? Like it just, it's, yeah. it's surreal. Yeah. I have, I believe, let's see where I'm at right now. Um, I love how oh as we're talking, like you bring up your computer screen, I can actually see the fluorescent glow. Against oh, really? You, so it's like, yeah, that's yeah. Cool. <laughs> I have 275 patrons right now, which is kind of wild. Um, I that's started about incredible. seven weeks ago, I think. Um, um, really, really fun, really wonderful community. Everyone on my Patreon is is awesome. Um, I have a Discord now too, and we we talk on there. Um, so yeah, super grateful for uh, their support. It basically launching a Patreon made it so that I, uh, am finally li making a living wage after, you know, seven or so months of, of sort of scrounging and relying on savings a little bit. So, yeah. Yes. So if you're listening to this, please go and join the titty pills. Okay. I have not butchered that. I think you nailed uh, it. please join the titty pills Patreon <laughs> and join Jesse's brigade of 200 plus soon to be 300 fans on, yeah. uh, on Patreon. I, some, some people call them the titty pals. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was wondering is like, cause when you develop a, a massive enough, I'm not saying massive, but like a sizable enough following, mm -hmm. like the fans want to call them something, call themselves something. So is that, is that like the first choice right now? Or are there like several names in contention or what? Um, recently there was an RCQ that two of my patrons were in the finals of it. Apparently they called themselves uh, team titty pills. So that's also fine. Uh, I think Titty Pals has a certain ring to it, though. So, you know, but I'll, I'll leave it up to them. They can call, you know, whatever you'd like. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So, Jesse, it's been an incredible pleasure. I'm so glad that you took the time out of your, your busy um, filmmaking schedule to, to talk to me. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. This was a great conversation.